on this 23rd of August, Sunday morning here at Norton Lane. Thank you for joining us here in the building, or if you're joining us live on YouTube, uh, don't forget you can access the service sheet and all the details of what we're doing this morning by clicking down on the tab and you'll find the, uh, the words for the hymns, and the Bible reading, and everything that you need to know. A few notices uh, just before we get started today. Don't forget tonight we have our 6pm evening service which will be on Zoom, which Chris, Lord willing, will be leading, where he'll we'll be carrying on our encounters with Jesus, and he'll be, Lord willing, looking at the encounter of Jesus of the, the Syrophoenician woman. So do join us on Zoom tonight at 6 o'clock. Next Sunday, Lord willing, I'll be preaching in the morning, and Stephen will be in the evening again, 6 o'clock, on Zoom. This week, as normal, we have our prayer meeting on Wednesday, which you'll receive by email. Uh, So do watch that and pray along with us. There's always points for prayer at the end, which can help you and guide you in your prayers through the week. We have our mum's Bible study at 2 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, which um, is on Zoom. And do contact Heather if if you'd like to join that for mums of any age. There's a few dates for your diary that I mentioned last week. Uh, Thursday, 3rd of September, we'll be starting a men's group. We start at 7.45, which will be on Zoom. You'll get an email about that in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be reading through a book together called Discovering God, which uh, there will be some more copies available if you haven't yet got your copy. So don't worry about that. If you haven't got a copy and like one, then do get in contact with me or Stephen. Friday the 4th of September we're starting Jam Club again which will be on Zoom as uh, many, many things are at the moment on Zoom so it's a, a wonderful piece of technology that we can use. That will be 4 o'clock on Friday the 4th of September. And just advance notice which I mentioned last week, Saturday the 3rd of October uh, Gospel Reformation UK are putting on an online uh, women's conference called True Women for Christ, where speakers include Susan Hunt, who's written a number of books for women and children's books, uh, Davinia Young, and Collie Minna, Miller. And please see that link uh, on your paper or electronically on an email uh, for more information and for booking that. That's Saturday the 3rd of October from 3 till 6 p.m. Now before we come to our God in worship this morning, let us us pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to gather as brothers and sisters, as your children, as your people to worship together this morning. Thank you for your goodness to us that you have called us from darkness into light from, from death into life. Thank you that we can worship you and praise you. And may this morning and this evening and this whole day be set apart for you to do us good and to bless us. That we may be fed richly for the week ahead. Oh, be pleased to be at work amongst us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's hear our call to worship from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful to sing a song of praise as we begin our service this morning, but let us instead sing a song of praise in our heads as we listen to the music and read along this morning. Let us praise God together in our first hymn.
Let us continue in worship as we pray to our, our God together. Our Heavenly Father and Great God, there are so many different reasons for us to praise you with our lives, with our lips, with our thoughts, with our actions. To offer our praise to you and give you thanks for who you are. You are our Sovereign Lord, the most powerful and awesome God who knows all things, who's made all things, in control of all things, who does all things well. You are most kind and most generous. Every day we know there will be morning and evening. There will be summer, winter, autumn and spring. The world will keep spinning that gives us night and day. Oh, we thank you and praise you for creation. We thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our King and our Saviour, who gave his life to bring us into your family. We thank you and praise you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for his encouragement and his counsel, his illuminating our hearts and minds to understand, hear your word. We thank you that you are a triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We thank you for your amazing grace that you have showed us right from Adam and Eve by clothing them, by protecting them and looking after them. We thank you for your grace to hell-deserving sinners in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your patience with us. As you were patient with Moses and those who were your people wandering in their wilderness. Father, for how often do we grumble? Do we complain? Are we, do we, are we jealous of, of others and what they have and and not content with what you've given us and our situations. Forgive us of our sin. Forgive us for our grumbling and rebellion and how you order all things and order our lives. Forgive us when we turn against you and think we know better. We thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ who for the joy that was set before him and jeweled the cross that we may be brought into fellowship with you that we may be washed and sanctified and justified in your sight thank you oh great God that you are our God who else is like you majestic in holiness awesome in power you are the one true living God and we thank you that we can rejoice and praise you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's hear our assurance of forgiveness this morning, which is from John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen. Now is the time in our, in our service for our children's talk. Our children's talk. So children, you're listening carefully, attentively with your eyes and your ears. Because I want to play a game this morning. Now adults, feel free to join in as well. If you feel like you just can't help yourself, you carry on. No one's going to think badly at all. Who knows? Put your hand up if you know the game Simon Says. Ah, whoever put their hand up, you're now automatically taking part. Well done. Simon Says, put your hand on your head. Simon Says, touch your nose. Simon Says, touch your elbow. You know where your elbow is? Simon Says, wave your hand up in the air. Simon says, can you touch your toes? Touch your cheek. Uh, we're not going to go through the whole rounds and until we get a winner. But copying, copying what Simon says, it's a good game, isn't it? It's, a, it's also an example of what we do through all of life, don't we? We learn by copying. We learn by copying our mummies and daddies at home. We learn by copying and learning at school. 
don't we? That's how we learn. And it's also how we learn as Christians. So what, it, what does it mean to be a Christian? What do Christians do? Well, we learn by copying. And who's, who should we be copying as Christians? Jesus. And in the Bible passage we're going to be looking at today in Mark chapter 1, we're going to see that Jesus does three things that are very important to him. Three things that we should copy. The first one is this. What's this? You might not be able to see the the lady in the picture, or you might not be able to read the word. So if you can't do either of those, I'd better describe it to you. What did you say? Praying. Well, you have brilliant eyesight. I made this big so I could read it. So well done. Praying. Praying is the first one. Who? But what is praying? What do you do when you pray? You pray to God. That's right. Is that what you were going to say, William? You were. That's right. You pray to God. You speak to God. Praying. That was one of the first things Jesus is doing in our passage. Praying. That was really important to Jesus. In fact, he got up really early in the morning to pray. So that's the first one. The second one, what do you think this is? There's another, another doing verb there. What did you say, William? A nurse. A nurse. And what's the nurse doing to that lady there? What is she doing? Pardon? Helping. That's right. That's very good. So I put caring, but helping is a very good word as well. So that she's helping the lady or caring for the lady. And that's what Jesus is doing as well in our passage. He's caring for his disciples or teaching them or correcting them because they've gone a bit wrong. And so he's loving them by caring them, by directing them in the right direction. Like if you get lost, you might ask for help. Or if you see someone who's lost, thinking, oh, I just don't know where I'm going, you might say, oh, are you lost? It's that way. So he's caring and helping. And there's uh, one more here. What's this one? The picture's not extremely obvious. Yes, William? What are they doing in the picture? Well, it is part of helping, yes. Have you got your hand up, Aaron? Really? They're sharing. Sharing. Well, this man, the tall man with the glasses, he's sharing the gospel. He's telling these other people about Jesus. And that was something else that was really important to Jesus, was sharing the good news about himself, not just keeping it to himself and and hiding away, but going out through all the different places in the area to tell other people about Jesus. He was sharing. So these three things that we've seen, praying, caring, and sharing, they're three things that were really important to Jesus. And if we're a Christian, if we love Jesus, then what's important to him will be important to us as well. We want to pray to God. We want to look after each other. And we also want to share the good news about Jesus with other people. Thank you very much for listening. Well done, you've done very well this morning. We're going to come to a time of of prayer now before we sing again in just a moment. There's a few things, amongst others, that would be good for us to pray for this morning. Uh, many, many of you will know of Josh Riga. He's the minister up in Hexham Presbyterian Church, part of our denomination. Hexham in the north, east of England, by Newcastle. Well, just this week, his wife was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, that's Gina Riga, her, his wife. And so it'd be good to pray for them as a family. I think they have three children. Good to pray for their church. It's a relatively recent church plant. And it would be good to remember them in our prayers this morning. Good also to pray for uh, Sean and Natasha. If you got Chris's email this week about their graduation ceremony, the African African Bible University. You know, Sean has visited here a number of times. 
And so it would be good to give thanks to God for all those who are graduating and, and pray that he will lead them and, and in Africa, wherever they're going to minister, that he will work through them. So let us remember Sean and Natasha, Africa Bible University, in our prayers as well this morning. Let's pray together. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that one of the most important things to Jesus Christ was prayer, was bringing everything to you, was submitting to your will, was calling on his heavenly Father, was enjoying fellowship with you. And oh Lord, if it was so important to Lord Jesus Christ, so necessary for him, how much more is it necessary for us? And so we bring all our requests to you in prayer. No matter how big, no matter how small, help us to come to you humbly, submissively, desperately, eagerly in prayer. We lift up to you the Riga family, Josh and Gina. We thank you for them. Thank you for the work you've been doing through them up in Hexham, that very needy area. Thank you for the church that you've established there. We pray for them at this time as they've heard the news about Gina's health and this breast cancer diagnosis. I pray that you may bless them and strengthen them and increase their faith and trust in you. We pray that you may uh, bless the doctors and nurses with wisdom, just ex- with, with exactly what treatment to do. Bless their marriage and them as a family. Help them as a church as they, as they deal with this news. That they may, may draw ever closer together and to you, their Heavenly Father. And so we lift them up and pray that you will, you will be with them. That through this situation you will be glorified. Heavenly Father, we pray for those amongst us who are sick, who are not well, who are suffering at the moment. We pray for Lynn Marie and the treatment and the chemotherapy she's starting. Please be with her and bless her and their family. Be with Dion and and Leo and Mia. We thank you for them. Help us to keep remembering them in our prayers, that you will be at work doing mighty and wondrous things in that situation. We pray and we rejoice with Africa Bible University. We thank you for Sean and Natasha and the news that they've given us at their graduation for this year, the class of 2020. We thank you for such a a large number who have finished their studies, who are now being sent out into the field, into the mission field, sent out into churches in countries all over Africa. We rejoice that the church is growing so fast there. And we pray and we thank you for this college, this university that is a means where ministers and and gospel workers can be trained, trained to teach people richly the wonders of your glory from your word and in in theology and in, in doctrine. Please build those churches there. There will not be a, a shallow Christianity where they'd just be feeding on milk, but there, where they'd be feeding on solid and rich food from your word. Please uh, be with them as they think about the new intake for this next year and, and what that means in this current situation with COVID. I pray you'll be with the professors and the teachers there and Sean and Natasha themselves. Please protect them. Have mercy on them and provide for all their needs. And raise up more men and women to go and take the gospel to those needy areas in those countries in Africa. Father, we thank you for these things. Please look after us. Answer our prayers. Continue with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to come to our our second him now which is based on Psalm 116. I love the Lord who heard my cry and granted my request.
Before we come to God's Word this morning, we're looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 35 to 39. Let us pray and ask that He will help us. A gracious and almighty God, we pray that You will open our eyes that we may see marvelous and wondrous things from Your Word. Challenge us, encourage us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. We've been going through Mark's Gospel, and today we've reached chapter 1, verses 35 to 39. Jesus has finished a busy and hectic first day of public ministry, and this scene that we, we are going to be reading this morning is very early the next morning. So let us hear the Word of God. And rising very early in the morning... While it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Amen. If you were to record what activities and what things you do throughout the day, every hour, maybe even every ten minutes... Which activities do you think in your life would come at the very top? Which activities do you spend most of the time throughout the day doing? Well, maybe sleep would come top of your list, possibly. Maybe you get about seven to eight hours sleep. Maybe it's eating. I think I worked out, I spend about one to two hours eating throughout the day, which I was quite surprised by. Maybe it's your work, what you do between 9 and 5 or 8 and 4, whichever hours you work. Maybe it's your work that takes up the biggest chunk of your day. Maybe it's watching the television. Maybe that takes up a a bigger chunk than you think or you thought. Maybe it's driving. If you have a long commute every morning and then again in the evening... And then in between while you're at work and then in the evenings as you're going to different places and shops and and taking the children to places and going here and there, you actually spend more time in your car than you think. Maybe it's the amount of time you spend on your phone, on your laptop, on the internet, that it might not seem like big chunks of time, but if you add up all the ten minutes that you spend every hour, it's a long time, isn't it? You know, once you've worked that out, you can see that how you spend your time will reveal to you what's most important to you in your life. How you spend your time, what you spend more time doing than you thought, what you spend less time doing than you hoped, will reveal to you your priorities. Someone who spends hours in the gym and researching different exercises. Their health and their body is very important to them. Someone who spends hours on social media, going through all their friends, liking all the different posts, posting pictures of them eating pizza or whatever, will will show that person that their reputation, that their self-worth and position is most important to them and how how they're getting on compared to their friends. Someone who spends more time at work than than doing anything else, doing overtime, even when they're at home, they can't switch off and still thinking about work, might show that person that power, career, and making more money are most important. But as Christians... What should be the most important things to us? What should be our priorities? Should it be the same as the world? Of Monday to Saturday is the same. Sunday, I spend a few hours at church, 
But in, the to- in, in looking at the whole week, it's not really that much. Should our priorities be the same as the world? Or should, we be, should our lives be shaped differently? Should we be different? So how do we know what our priorities should be? As Christians, as I asked the children, if you remember their answers, then that's a clue. How do we know what our priority should be as Christians? Should it be, how do we know? Well, we're going to see from this short passage, just verses 35 to 39, That right at the start of Jesus' ministry, he sets the shape of his ministry, its flavour, its focus, and his priorities right from the beginning. He's had a very busy first day, as we saw last week, teaching in the synagogue, an exorcism, healing, people coming to him after dark. He's had a very first day of public ministry. And the scene we're looking at this morning... For 35 and 39, you see, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. It's probably not even six o'clock in the morning yet. Very early in the morning. That's the scene here. And here at this time, Jesus is going to show us his priorities. And we're going to see three priorities this morning. Praying, discipling, and preaching. Praying, discipling, and preaching. So let's look at those uh, one by one then. The first one, his priority as a life of prayer. A life of prayer, praying to God. You see that in verse 35. Rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed. He went out to a desolate place And there he was praying. And there he prayed. You see, from this verse, Jesus has a a top priority of prayer. Let's have a look how we know that this is Jesus' priority. What did Jesus' prayer involve? Well, firstly, it would have involved planning. It wasn't a random act. He didn't wake up earlier than normal because some cat was meowing outside and he thought, oh, I'll I'll go and pray then. No, he planned this deliberately. It was not spontaneous. And in the Bible, you do get examples of spontaneous prayers, of kind of arrow prayers, like, Lord, help me at this time. And they're good as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. But this is not talking about that. This is talking about a planned time of prayer. See, he purposely determines to wake up very early in the morning, before it's even light. Probably, possibly, four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. Everyone else is still asleep. He knew where he was going. You see, he determined to depart, to go out to a desolate place, to leave the house to leave the town of Capernaum where he is and to go out. So this would have meant not just a, I'll just go into the next room, but a getting ready to go out into the cold, to go out and pray. This would have meant a journey, a walk, which would have meant planning to know where he's going. He Planning. His prayer was planned, which shows that it was important to Jesus. Because what you spend a lot of time planning must be important to you. Because you spend time thinking about it. You want to make it just right. I don't know if how many of you have ever planned a wedding. Where you start maybe six months, eight months, a year in advance. And you start planning the wedding. You start planning who's going to be on the guest list. You start planning what food you're going to have. You start planning what kind of rings are we going to have. Where are we going to have it? Who are we going to invite? What music are we going to have? What flowers? You spend a lot of time planning the wedding to make it just right. Because it's important. But Jesus planned his prayers. Because they were important. You notice the time of his praying. 
He was first thing in the morning. Now, for some of you, you might call yourself morning people. You love the morning. You can get up and you're ready to go. Or you might be more night owls. You might be more functioning and awake come seven, eight o'clock at night. But whatever you are, give your best time, the time when you're functioning the best, when your brains are in gear, plan to give that time to Jesus, to, to prayer. Because for Jesus, that was the morning. To give your first fruits, the best of your time and your energy to God. God doesn't just want the scraps of your time when you're, when you're falling asleep or well, I'll, I'll kill two birds with one stone because praying helps me fall asleep. No, he wants your best time. He wants you to be focused. And so that requires planning and thinking about it. And so when is your best time of the day? Is it mid-morning once you've had your breakfast? Is it lunchtime? Is it the evening? Plan that to be your time of prayer. And you see that as well as planning that prayer is a priority for Jesus because of his discipline. It's not easy getting up early in the morning. Even if you are a morning person, you don't naturally wake up early in the morning. It requires discipline. And after a very hectic day the day before of healing and casting out demons, Jesus would have been tired. He was, yes, fully God, but he's also fully man. He would have needed sleep. He would have needed food and rest. And yet he was disciplined to give that time to prayer. Why? Because he loves praying. He enjoys his relationship with his heavenly father. And so he works hard to make it a non-negotiable, to carve out time to give to prayer. To give to that time of sweet fellowship with God. And it takes discipline, it takes motivation. Like I can't wait to get up in the morning. I remember I used to be like that on Christmas Day. Getting up at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning. Is it Christmas Day yet? Because of my motivation for presents, I expect. But Jesus can't wait to get up early in the morning to pray. To pray. To travel not just to the other side of the room, but out of the town to a desolate place, a quiet place. And we read from other gospel accounts like Luke 5, 16, which tells of the same situation, the same scene. That this was a regular thing for Jesus. That he would regular, regularly go out early in the morning to pray. This wasn't just a one-off. See, what becomes deliberate and what you start off having to force yourself to do, if you do it between, I think I read about 40 to 60 times, it becomes a habit. From becoming something you do consciously to something that becomes a subconscious habit. Of course I pray in the morning. It's what I've always done. Of course I clean my teeth in the morning. It's what I always do every morning. It becomes a habit. So what are the non-negotiables in your life? What are the things that you would gladly, without even a question, carve out time for? See, prayer, it is difficult, isn't it? Prayer is really hard. It's so easy to think of 101 things to do apart from pray. I'll I'll pray, but once I've done the washing up, once I've read this, once I've done made the children are asleep, then if I've got some time left, then I'll pray. It needs discipline, purpose, effort and determination and hard work. And so, if you're not in this kind of habit of praying daily, start small. Don't think the first thing you need to do is, okay, I've got an hour to pray. What do I do? Start small. Start with just 10 minutes every day and build on that. There's some great prayers you can read throughout the Bible. Look at the prayer 
that Jesus teaches his disciples to pray in Matthew 6 or Luke 11. There's other great prayers you can read in the Old Testament. Read some of Paul's letters, you you see the things that he's praying for. There's other great books you can read which will guide you in your prayers. One that I find really helpful is called Valley of Vision, which is by the Banner of Truth, which is an excellent collection divided up into different topics of lots of different prayers. And so they're good just to get ideas of what to pray for. You can make a list, list of people you want to pray for to help you remember You can make a a list of things you want to praise God for. Start off your prayers with Bible reading. Something in the passage that you may have read will think, I would like to praise God for that or thank God for that. But start praying. And another thing that shows that, that this was a priority for Jesus was that he purposely went to a desolate place where he could be alone. Where he could have a quality time with God. Where he knew he wasn't going to be distracted. He he wasn't going to be interrupted. When sometimes you want to have a good conversation with somebody. You might not choose to go to a busy cafe or a restaurant. But you might say, let's go for a walk in this park. Or come over to my house. No one else is in. Come over for a quiet time. See, that time of, of privacy, of, of quiet, from free from distraction, means you're free to focus fully on God. It's so easy, isn't it? I find a mobile phone can be very distracting. The, all the different noises it makes, you think, oh, what's that noise mean? Oh, what does that noise mean? Oh, oh it's vibrated. What does that mean? Put it away. Put it somewhere else. Go away from free from distraction to give quality time to pray to your heavenly Father. Oh, why was prayer such a such a priority for Jesus? Why was it so important for him? Was it because he was just setting an example? He was hoping that his disciples would come and find him. Say, oh, that's what we should be doing. No, because he purposefully says. Well, this is how then you should pray. Teaching prayer in Matthew 6, Luke 11. Here we don't get an actual recording of what Jesus prayed. It just says he was praying. He was praying because he needed to. He's praying because he wanted to. Because he loved to. It was a priority because it was important to him. Even he, the sinless, perfect Son of God, he prayer by evidence of his behavior, his planning, his discipline, his making sure he was alone and free from distraction, showed that it was a priority for him. It was necessary for him and essential for his ministry, for the work that he'd been sent to do. Three times in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is recorded as praying. This is the first one. The second one is in Mark 6, 46, with the feeding of the 5,000. And the third one is in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark chapter 14. And each of those occasions at the beginning of his ministry, in the middle of his ministry, and near the end and, and pivotal moment of his ministry... He's wanting to submit to the will of his heavenly Father. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Humbly coming before him. Seeking provision, nourishment for the ministry ahead. And so we could admire the Lord's devotion. And communion with his Father, the relationship he loved And there's something stunningly beautiful about the Lord's priorities. His first priority wasn't to go to the palace in Jerusalem. Wasn't to go to where all the important people are. It was to go away by himself. To spend time with his Father in heaven. He wasn't eager, quick to go back to where he was famous. 
to go back to where all the people were gathering, wanting him to heal, so he could enjoy the big rallies. No, his priority was simple, childlike prayer with his Father. And so, yes, we can learn from the Lord's example and habit of prayer. Prayer is hard. C.S. Lewis said, The moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like a herd of wild animals. They rush at you like a herd of wild animals. And so it takes planning and discipline and quality time alone for prayer. Do you see prayer is necessary? Do you see it as important? Jesus did. How much more important is it for us weak and needy creatures to pray, lead me not into temptation, to pray your kingdom come, to pray deliver me from evil, to pray your will be done today, not my will be done. So do you pray? Is it a priority? What would you give yourself if you were to score yourself out of ten? Is it a priority for us as a church? Are you excited about the prayer meeting starting again? Let's turn prayer from from being a duty and soon it will become a delight. So that's Jesus' first priority is praying. His second priority is discipling or looking after and correcting his disciples. You notice from verses 36 to 38, it says, And Simon and those who were with him, they searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus said, just as he called them in Mark 1, 17, Follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. But that involves following me and it's something that Jesus is active in. I will make you to become fishers of men. I will do a work in you that I'm starting now. Follow you, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Disciples and followers of me. It's not something we do naturally. It's something that Jesus is making them to become. And you see, right from the beginning here, that the disciples, yes, with good intentions, yet their priorities are wrong. Their priorities are wrong. You see, Andrew, Peter, James and John, says Simon here and those who were with him, which is probably the other disciples, they were in their hometown. They were proud to be associated with Jesus. Jesus had become famous, you see, in 128, and at once his fame had spread around everywhere. He'd become famous, and they were proud, and we're following Jesus. Or you're with that Jesus, the one we went to, who healed amazingly, who cast out that demon. Yes, that's the one we follow. And then when they wake up in the morning expecting another day of hyped-up ministry, they look and Jesus is gone. And so they're looking for him. And the word there for they looked for him, they searched for him, is actually a word for like hunting or pursuing an enemy at war. It's a hostile word. They're looking for Jesus. They're pursuing Jesus because they're dissatisfied that he wasn't there and available for them to parade out again and said, look, Jesus is back again. Come, come over here. And when they say, everyone is looking for you, now that, that, sound, that sounds good, a good intention to look for Jesus, but when Mark uses that word looking for you or seeking you, in Mark's gospel it always has negative connotations. It appears ten times in Mark's gospel. It's used in chapter 3 verse 32, where his mother and brothers are looking for Jesus. Because they don't believe him. They think he's out of his mind. In 11, 11, chapter 11, verse 18, it's used. After Jesus is cleared out the temple, the chief priests and the scribes 
were looking, were seeking how to destroy him. In 14.1, they're looking for ways to arrest him. In 1455, they're seeking, they're looking to testify against him. So everyone looking for Jesus in Mark's gospel has a negative connotation. Because here they're seeking to distract Jesus from his ministry. They're seeking to control him. He's the miracle man, come and see him. They're seeking to take advantage of him and just wheel him out when it's needed. They're seeking to distract Jesus from his ministry and his mission. That his actions should be determined by the needs of the crowds. And so Jesus gently corrects them. He doesn't shout. He doesn't tell them to go away, I'm praying, leave me alone. He says in verse 38, and he said to them, he didn't argue, he just said, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. Why? For that is why I came out. Not came out early in the morning to pray, but that is why I was sent. That is why God sent me. That is why I willingly came from heaven to earth to preach the gospel. So he gently encourages them. They've got their priorities wrong. Their tracking is skew if. They keep going to the left. And he's saying, let me bring you back to the straight path. Directing them back. Explaining to them, which would have been a shock and surprise for the crowds that they may have just left gathering. Let's go to another place. Let's go to another place, because that's why I came. Not just to be a miracle man of Capernaum, but to go throughout the whole region, to take the gospel eventually to the entire world. That gentle correction of our Lord. He reminds you of, from Acts chapter 18, and Priscilla and Aquila, when they met Apollos. And Apollos was a very good and natural public speaker. He loved God and he was a good, gifted speaker and preacher. And yet some things weren't quite right. And there was this lovely couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who didn't shout at him in the crowd, but gently took him aside. And they explained to him the way of God more accurately. And he humbly took it and accepted it. And learnt. And you see that with the disciples as well. They don't say, no Jesus. What are you doing? Although Peter will later on. They say, let's go. They were followers of Jesus. So discipling. Even at this moment, in the early hours. He takes every opportunity. To shape, to guide, to direct, to correct his disciples because he loves them because he wants them to share in his priorities because he wants them to be better he has a priority of seeing those who are closest to him thrive and grow do we share that same priority in wanting to see each other The people sat on your row. The people sat behind you. Do you have a priority of wanting to see them thrive in the Christian faith? And grow in their love for the Lord? And if you see them or hear them talking about something that's not quite right, do you ignore it? Do you leave it or do you say, let's come over to my house or let's go for a coffee? And do you then gently explain to them the ways of God more accurately? Make it a priority as a church to see each other being built up and grown. Gently pastoring and discipling each other. Helping one another. We're very good at that. When someone is ill or sick, I cut my finger earlier. And immediately a plaster ended up on my finger. Alan, this was the pulpit that did that. Don't worry. 
So we're very good at helping each other. What about spiritually? What about a walk with the Lord? Asking each other, how is your prayer life? How have you been doing with that thing you were suffering with? And we can do this, each one of us, discipling one another out of love. It's like cleaning a lighthouse. You clean the glass so the light can shine brighter. And so if we help each other, and as a church we'll we'll be a beacon that shines brighter and brighter in this street and in Lecampton to guide people away from the rocks. And to life in Christ. So discipling. Discipling was his second priority from this passage. And just thirdly and finally, as we look to finish this morning, his third priority was preaching. Preaching from in verse 39. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. The reason why he came out was to preach. And we, in verses of chapter 1, 14 and 15, talks about like a little snippet of what Jesus was preaching. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He's proclaiming God's reign. The king has come. Freedom from captivity. Restoration for those who are sick with sin. Physical healing was just temporary. But a right relationship with God, which we're going to actually be looking at just at the beginning of chapter 2, a right relationship with God brings spiritual wholeness, which is forever. He's after a, a, a quality of a relationship with God and not a quantity of relationship. He knows the necessity and importance of preaching for the whole of the Christian life. In Romans 10, 14, read, How are they to believe in whom they have never heard, and how are they to hear unless someone preaches? Not draws them a diagram or shows them a picture, but unless someone preaches. Everyone who calls on the name, therefore, will be saved. In John 17, 17, so not just the beginning of the Christian life, entering relationship, but also continuing John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. And in Acts 2, 42, it says the apostles were devoted, that the church were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Psalm 119 is your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my pathway. See, the importance of preaching in every area of life for our conversion that the Holy Spirit works through preaching Jesus speaks and it brings those who are dead in their trespasses and sins to life in Christ and it's amazing that Jesus Christ the Son of God came as a preacher by preaching sinners are brought into the church and saved the church is built up You read through Acts and you see sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon of Peter preaching, Paul preaching, Apollos. It's a massive thing. It's very important and it was a top priority for the Lord. He didn't come to heal. He came to preach. So God ordained an endorsed method. The road in which sinners are brought in to relationship with God and preaching for us as Christians if you're not a Christian today some way in which we're nourished and fed that we're sanctified that we're made more like Jesus through the preaching of the word so how do you view preaching is it just something that happens at church but I'm really looking forward to the end when I can get my cup of coffee, hopefully in the next year or so. Or I'm looking forward to the hymns. How do you view the preaching? Do you see it as important? Do you prepare? Are you listening attentively?
It is a means of grace. A means in which a loving God, the Lord Jesus Christ, our King and Saviour, in which he builds his church, which he feeds his people, But how can these priorities of Jesus's, how can they be our priorities? Is it just as easy as, okay, so I need to do this and this and this? Is it just that simple? How can we live Christ-shaped lives? Can we do it by ourselves? Well, you notice that from verse 29 to 34, it's talking about the Sabbath which was the Saturday, the seventh day, the last day of the week. Verse 35, Jesus Jesus rises very early in the morning on the first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath, the seventh day. Our passage is the first day of the week. Well, when will be the next time in Mark when Jesus will rise early on the first day of the week? His resurrection. His resurrection. After his death on the cross and burial, he rises on the first day of the week. In John 20, he talks about, I'm going to my father and your father. Tell my brothers. It's through his resurrection that we're brought into relationship with God, that we are united to Christ through his death and resurrection. Which means that his priorities can become our priorities. Which means we become new creations, new creatures in Christ. Brothers and sisters of Christ. Which means as he teaches, we can pray our Father. We can pray through the mouth of Christ, united to him as his people, our Father who art in heaven. His priorities we can share because we share with him his status as a child of God, as a son of God. It is only through his resurrection and completed salvation that his priorities can become ours. And these means of grace, praying, discipling, fellowship, preaching, these gifts from God can actually work in us because it is his Holy Spirit who came to shape us. To mould us, to conform us to his likeness. But what shape do these priorities, what shape do these important things to Jesus, what shape do they give his life? It's a life of love for God, a life of love for his people, and a life of loving sinners. What about your priorities? What about the most important things to you? What flavour, what shape do they give your life? May God forgive us when we go wrong in our priorities. May he shape us to share in the priorities of our older brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are united to, to love what he loves. To be more like him. May God help us in these things. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can pray to you as our Father because we've been brought into that relationship of Jesus Christ with you. We thank you that in that union we have with him, We can pray to you, our Father, that we are your children adopted into your family. We thank you that we have brothers and sisters. We thank you that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves. We thank you for his love for those who are lost, those sinners, that brought in people like us. Help us to share in the same heart and love and priorities as the Lord Jesus Christ that we may enjoy fellowship with you and love you and praise you, our God. In Jesus' name, Amen.
going to come to our final hymn now as we close our time of worship this morning, which is, My Redeemer and my Lord, I read, I read my duty in your word, but in your life the law appears, drawn out in living character. Let us sing in our minds to God's glory. Let us close with these words from the end of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.